Welcome to the show. It's Tuesday. We're going to talk some NASCAR with Rod Mullins. And uh, let's start uh, talking about last week's race in Nashville and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, near Nashville, anyway, the Ally 400 in Lebanon, Tennessee. Ross Chastain getting his third Cup Series victory. Um, and uh, well, you know, Sunday night's race, uh, Chastain, you know, known for being reckless out there. Uh, you know, how did, how did he bring this one in and, uh, did he have to plow through some people to get there? Well, let's just put it this way. He didn't have to plow through anybody. I mean, <laughs> he just used some good old fashioned racing is what he did. And he capped off what could be considered a perfect weekend in any way you talk about it. He picked up his first poll, his first, you know, uh, poll of the season ever in his career since joining the cup series. And then, you know, they had a sold out crowd at Nashville. There were, I mean, the, the stands were just filled to capacity and here he was 30 years old. He goes and wins this race and beats out Martin Truex Jr. and also Denny Hamlin, who he has had a number of run-ins over the past few years with. And uh, he just, you know, and that's at a, their home track, too. Nashville is sort of the, um, the I, can't, I guess, the home base, so to speak, for track house racing. And that's where, you know, he felt like that they covered all the bases this past weekend there in Nashville. Plus, at the same time, I think it also introduced the uh, the rest of the world, the rest of the country, to the fact that Nashville is hungry for some racing, and they want some racing there in the city. They, I mean, hey, they've got IndyCar. They, you know, they do a street race IndyCar there. Of course, they've got the Titans. They've got you know different things. They've got a, a soccer team. Uh, they're really trying to push to make nashville a southern hub for a lot of these great sports and nascar is just another one that they're hoping to be able to add and bring it there in the next couple of years and move it into downtown nashville so um you know i read a story about a uh, track house owner's uh name is justin marks and he talked about mm -hmm. after the race he said he talked with uh, rick hendrick and roger penske for advice on handling a guy like chastain who can be quite aggressive let's just say and um, after after you know talking with them, Marx compared Chastain to guys like Brad Keselowski and Kevin Harvick, Tony Stewart, aggressive drivers who had to learn how to kind of dial it back just a little bit. You know, you you still want to be aggressive, but also not knock yourself out of contention by being too aggressive. Um, you know, in in that context, maybe this is a big win uh, just to show that okay, you know, aggression can actually work if if you kind of just if you could just dial it back just enough. Well, I think this was the Ernie Irvin come to Jesus talk that uh, Ernie Irvin and uh, Richard Petty and a lot of them had back, oh, I guess in the 90s when he was running there before he uh, left uh, Morgan McClure Racing and went over to Robert uh, Yates Racing uh, after the death of Davey Allison. But yeah, this is very similar to that. You know, the everybody up in arms, they were ready to just, you know, cast him out. They were ready to cast stones at him hang him for that much you know that some of them wanted to just go ahead and do that but i think i said uh you know several podcasts back i think i made the comment i said he's just doing what he is supposed to do what he feels like he is supposed to do to win a race and yeah maybe he's done it a little bit too aggressively and i agree with this this is one of those things where they had to kind of pull the reins back i mean hey if you've got a horse and it's running full power and you're only a quarter of the way into the race and everything it's time that you start dialing that horse back a little bit, building up a little bit in order to finish that race. I mean, that's what happens at most of these uh, horse races, and especially with the Kentucky Derby, we start seeing the the front runner who is picked to be a front runner out of it start to make their move toward about three quarters of the way, halfway, three quarters of the way around, you know, the track. Same thing here with you know Ross Chastain. I think he did the same thing. He patiently let the track come to him. He went had dialed back he did not try you know this was the funny thing about it too he said i did so i won this race without hitting anybody and knocking them out i think that was just funny and i think he realizes it now he realizes yeah i can win some races if i dial back but he also said i think post-race he said you know there's been a lot of people it's told him he needs to change to be a certain way and stuff but he thought more than anything else 
he had kind of come into his own as a driver on Sunday night. And I agree with that. I think he came into it uh, being a driver and, you know, a lot of places right now are talking about the fact of he could be a championship contender. If he has more races like this for what's left of the season, you know, he's in the running for it. He could be in the running for a, a championship. So the other big news other than the, the, the winner of the top five was the crash involving Ryan Blaney uh, just under halfway uh, in uh, lap 146 on a restart. Uh, Blaney uh, was tapped from behind by Kyle Busch. Blaney said afterwards he had checked up a little bit on the restart, got hit from behind. He couldn't get straight up. And after hitting the grass, uh, he, he hit a, a wall, hit the wall head on. Uh, and a, a strange little coincidence, it's one of the parts of the wall there without a safer barrier. Uh, and uh, he said it's the hardest hit of his life. And he said it was pretty ridiculous that he could hit a part of the wall that somehow does not have a safer barrier. I can't, I, Ron, I don't, I don't know that a lot of fans out there can believe there are still parts of walls on NASCAR tracks that don't have the safer barrier. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, you look at Bristol. Bristol is, got, is one of those tracks, the inner wall per se, and this is what that was. It was one yep. of those infield walls. Uh, the inner wall right there along pit road, it doesn't have any kind of safety protection or anything except on the corners where they have the, uh, the water barrels. They've got those in there for safety just in case. But uh, yeah, this one at Nashville did not have any kind of safer barrier. And, and I'm kind of wondering too, if you're going to put walls up and you're going to have walls, uh, you know, around the track, if it's going to be on the outside, if it's going to be on the inside, put the safer barrier walls. I don't care how much styrofoam or how much more that you've got to put in there. You've got to make it safe. This was one of those things of where Elton Sawyer, who's like the director of competition with NASCAR, he made the comment and said, well, he kind of hit the wall where he wasn't supposed to. And it's like, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense to it. If he's, <laughs> if you know, hitting the wall where he wasn't supposed to, it's like, Everything on a racetrack is fair game. That's that's kind of the way I look at it. I mean, I hate to say it that kind of way, but uh, it almost sounds like I'm downplaying it. And, and in one way, I think this is one of those things of where Speedway Motorsports, NASCAR, they're all going to kind of get on the same page here, and they're all going to kind of look at this thing, and they're going to say, hey, look, this is what we need to do in order to improve our safety rating, so to speak, on these guys, you know, especially in these kind of races, they need to be protected. And and I agree with him. I, you know, I think that was just, I, I think, uh, I think Ryan Blaney's comment was it's something along the lines of it was effing ludicrous or something like that, I think was what the comment was. And, uh, you know, and I have to agree with him. You know, NASCAR makes a lot of calls and sometimes they're not very, they're not very great calls. They're not, favorites of the crowd of the fans and so forth but this is one that you know i'm kind of like this is what i'm doing i'm scratching my head and i'm wondering why why wasn't this wall protected and we're lucky i mean i'm sure that he's undergone some some you know uh, testing and so forth to check him whether or not he's had a concussion out of it but he took a really hard hit the energy just did not dissipate in the car as it was shooting across there across in the the grass area and then started making that beeline toward the wall it didn't slow down the the grass didn't slow it down and i thought for sure okay he's going to hit at a little bit of a different angle well he did hit at a slight angle the right front is what hit, but then when that right front made enough contact, it was like an accordion. It was like somebody just crashed it in. It didn't go and crumple up like an accordion, but it did bend that hood up pretty well. And, you know, he was lucky to come out of that uh, unscathed the way he did. You know, and I read a story too, Rod, about how um, th it, this, this accident exposed a, a recurring problem with the new design of the cars that basically these new cars are are not dissipating that energy the way right. that the previous designs did. So, you know, okay, so if we know that these, well, one, okay, let's work on the new cars and, and make them safer too. But if we know that in the meantime, the cars aren't as safe as the previous versions of cars that, that were driving around the track, that would make the safer berries e even more imperative, it would seem. Yeah, I think so too. I think this is just something that NASCAR – NASCAR's had a lot of things, you know, pardoning the baseball pun here. They've had a lot of curves thrown at them here in the last couple of years with this next generation car. And they've had some things happen. You know, who would have thought 
rubber, you know, marbles getting up inside of the car and stuff, and then getting superheated and then catching that uh, framework and some of the insides on fire in some of the cars and Kevin Harvick calling it out and saying, you know, it's a death trap. That's essentially what he said about the car. They made the changes. They got them done. Uh, this is one of those things that I think that even though you can do tons of testing and tons of control testing in certain situations, you have to expect the unexpected. You have to be looking for something that could possibly happen at any moment's, you know, any moment the way that it goes. And I think that NASCAR uh, should be looking at this as, you know, hey, let's wipe the sweat off our brow with this one. We dodged a bullet. But what's to say that we won't have a fatal accident before it's over with, with something that maybe NASCAR hadn't thought about? I hope it doesn't happen. But, you know, that could have been a really bad accident, though, on Sunday with Ryan Blaney. It could have messed him up, could have knocked him out of the you know, contention of the playoffs and, and having a, at least a run this season. But, uh, you know, he was lucky, but NASCAR is going to have to learn from this. And I think the drivers and the teams all have to work together on this instead of pointing fingers at each other and say, we got to work to make the driver safe and to ensure, you know, our investment in this driver, in this team. We have to do that. So some sad news to report as we're getting ready to, we'll talk later in the show about the upcoming race in Chicago, the street race in Chicago, which will be interesting in lots of ways. Jimmy Johnson was supposed to race in the uh, in the uh, Chicago Street Race this re- weekend, but he will not be in the race after the the deaths of his um, wife's parents and a nephew, uh, Jack Janway, uh, sixty nine, uh, his wife Carrie, sixty eight, and, and and their grandson Dalton Janway, eleven, discovered uh, in a uh, home in Muskegee, Oklahoma, on Monday night, and now I'm seeing Rod that it's a reported murder suicide um tragic news and obviously this 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 will keep jimmy johnson away from the track for a while yeah this will keep him away i know that they were hoping for a big thing coming back at chicago and being able to race they did not have a good performance at the coca-cola 600 and jimmy johnson was actually looking forward to this race with uh you know his previous experience running the road races in indycar and so forth he was looking to get back into it at least and get a little bit of a better shot at what he had done since indycar but yeah this is uh this is really depressing uh to hear this uh we're just hearing this whole thing as a murder suicide we don't know who did what what the situation may have been given the you know given what was going on and so forth um you know it's but it's just sad uh i know that uh his wife uh chanda you know it's it's rough it's going to be rough on her especially because of course it's her parents out of it but we don't know the whole story behind the 11 year old who is uh the grandson that was that was there you know either living there or at least close by so we don't know the situation with it a lot of this stuff is uh speculative up in the air right now and it's It's just one of those things that you just hate to report about. But, you know, Jimmy Johnson uh, being uh, the compassionate person that he is, and he cares for his wife deeply and the family, uh, he's decided to pull out this uh, this coming weekend at Chicago. Yeah, not that it makes it any better or or worse, but the uh, the Muskegee police are are saying that uh, Terry Janway, the wife, uh, apparently um, shot her husband and uh, and their grandson and then turned the gun on herself. Jack Janway was a prominent chiropractor in um, uh, Muskegee, Oklahoma, and uh, yeah, not a lot of details other known known, known other than that. But um, so horrible story, um, and uh, our our wishes, our, our our best thoughts are with the uh, Johnson family, the Janway family, as that goes on. So switching gears, uh, Rod, you um, saw an, you you read an interview on from Front Stretch Racing with uh, a. Now, former NASCAR Cup Series driver from the Augusta County area, my backyard, yes. Quinn Huff, mm-hmm. and uh, catching up with him and what he's up to these days. Well, you know, I've been wondering about him. I, you know, we'd gone almost, well, we we're almost a year and a half into, I guess, or two years actually, into the fact that uh, he hasn't raced. And I was wondering what had happened. You know, he had been able to race a, a number of uh, different events uh, back in 2021, but quiet in 2022 and uh you know since he had uh, his second full-time year in the nascar cup series he kind of decided to come home 
and did some soul searching, I think is what he said more than anything, Chris, and where he thought his career should go from, you know, where, how he got there and where did he go from there? And it's not saying that, you know, Quinn's not saying that it wasn't something that he was very blessed and humble uh, to be, you know, participant in the cup series, but, you know, he had the ability to be able to do it full time for a couple of years, but he came back home and he started working at the family business and come to find out literally a couple of weeks into it that they were going to have their firstborn child. Him and his wife were going to have their firstborn child. So, you know, if he was going to come back and race at Watkins Glen, that would have been last year, you know, with this whole thing, he couldn't have done it. So at that point, that's when he decided to just go ahead and he took a step away. And now he's gotten a little bit more passionate about the family business as well. And his involvement there is increasing. So he says he's not really put a lot of thought into racing here as of lately. He says, I think I'm supposed to be where I'm supposed to be at. And I've enjoyed not living on the road for the past two years. And I can I can kind of see that. Uh, in, in a lot of these race car drivers, some of them get to the point of where they get so antsy. They're like, I've got to get back into a car and I've got to get back into driving again. Trevor Bain is probably the other one right now, Trevor Bain. And then Quinn Huff, both of them young, uh, driving Trevor Bain realized, you know, it's not for me. This full-time thing is not for me traveling, you know, 36, 37, 38 weeks out of the year, plus doing promotional things, testing and different things like that. It can put a strain on a marriage. It can put a strain on a relationship, on a life. And, you know, now that Trevor Bain lost his ride with uh, with Roush Racing at that time, Roush Fenway Racing, he's gone back to Knoxville and he's looked at things, opened up, uh, I think, a couple of coffee shops down in the Knoxville area and still kind of piddles with this little thing of, driving on the Xfinity circuit every now and then he he does it just for the fun of it and I think he's got a younger brother I think that's involved in racing too so Quinn Huff bringing this up it just tells me that you know you're not finding the the young people that are eager to race as much as they used to anymore some of these guys were just so eager to race at one time but then when they look at it and they look at how far it's going to have to take them where they're going to have to go in order to be in the big time, so to speak. A lot of them get there and they say, I'm just not ready for this. And they take a step back. And then fortunately for Quinn Huff, it was paying attention to the family business a little bit more and it called him back home. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if your heart's not in it, you're not going to be successful. So, you know, um, you, it's, it's better to find that out now than it is several years down the road and maybe a, uh, broken family or, or two, uh, as the case may right. be. So, um, interesting ca- update on Quinn, uh, and, uh, where he stands. So, all right, let's get ready for Chicago. Now, Rod, what are they doing here? I mean, street race in Chicago, uh, how, how does this work and, uh, what can we look forward to this weekend? Well, just like the title it's on the street. It's <laughs> fortunately it's going to be well, and I, and I say this lightly, please, Anybody that's listening from the Chicago area, please don't get upset, but it's at least in the good section of town, if you want to call it that. It's not in a bad section of town, but they're going to be racing right around Grant Park is where they're going to be racing at. They're they're calling this the Grant Park 200 is what they're calling it, but I can't believe all of the gosh sponsorship and people getting involved in this Chicago race, people that you know, I've, I've maybe have heard of it one time or another, but jumping in to get sponsorship either on cars or on the wall as they're coming by there on some of the street, uh, some of the street venues where they're going to be at. Um, this is just unique for NASCAR. Um, I had said a couple of years ago, and I think I may have told you, I said, NASCAR is going to have to experiment with some things. They're going to have to experiment and try to broaden their horizon instead of staying on an oval. Well, we got the first experiment out of that with a dirt track racing on dirt. And that's what they did at Bristol. Now, unfortunately, that's going to come to an end because although the schedule is still being discussed, we don't know if dirt's going to be coming back to Bristol. We know it's not going to come back for a cup circuit race, but um, you know, I said something about it would be interesting to see what NASCAR could do if 
they had a street race, much like what they do when they have an IndyCar race in, in one of these towns. St. Petersburg, Tampa, St. Petersburg is, I was always known for having one. I think they have one in California too. Um, but this one in Chicago, this has set the entire Chicagoland region on its ear. They're just looking forward to this. I guess when you hear the headlines every day about somebody being shot and everything else, you're going to try to be on your best behavior and you're going to try to make it look inviting for people to come to Chicago, actually, instead of dodging bullets, but actually to watch a race or to enjoy Chicago. And I've been to Chicago before. I've been in this location where they're going to be running this race. It's a very picturesque place. It's nice. Uh, you know, it's just going to be a difference. You're not going to be able to go three wide in some of these streets like they did at Nashville this past weekend. Uh, but I think this is going to be a extremely challenging race for some of these drivers. And uh, I think some of them right now, um, I, I don't know. I think some of them are going to do really well. I think some of the veterans that we think that could do well on a street course are not going to do as well. I think this is going to favor somebody that has run the road courses like they have in the past. I'm just, it's, it's curious. I'm trying to read more about it as the uh, last couple of days have gone on to get ready for it. And just the idea, it's, it's a fascinating idea. Uh, the yeah. idea that NASCAR is taking over America's like basically second or third biggest city uh, for, for, and, and actually for the whole weekend, the uh, loop 121, the Xfinity race, uh, on Saturday, and then the uh, Grand Park 220, as you mentioned, on Sunday. Um, and I mean, they've got to create viewing areas. They got to create a pit area, you know. And it's it's right there in the middle of the city. It's just very interesting to think about, and will be even more interesting to see. They've been working on this, you know, ever since it was first announced. They have been doing the logistics. They've been doing all the planning. They've got all this taken care of. So, you know. Is it going to go off without a hitch? I'm sure there'll be something that'll happen. I, I hope not anything like what happened at Nashville with safer barriers, because that's what mostly a street course is. It's full of safer barriers all the way around with, you know, reinforcement and so forth. Um, I think more than anything else, this race is going to showcase more than anything else that NASCAR needs to move outside the oval a little bit more. They need to move from the regular short tracks. Uh, who knows this Coliseum experiment that they've done for so long, maybe they ought to do a similar sort of race or something, maybe out in California or something, maybe on the streets, maybe in Los Angeles. I don't know if they're wanting to get market share and try to get uh, the people watching and people interested into these races, I think they're going to have to take it to the street and not put it somewhere out on the, you know, out in the middle of nowhere to where they have to all go to the race and, and watch it and so forth. So I think it's going to be, I think it's a, a great experiment for this to find out what's going to actually, uh, how it's going to take place and how it's going to actually transpire on Sunday afternoon. I know NBC has got coverage on it. They've been interviewing all of the drivers. Uh, they've been interviewing Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jeff Burton, Dale Jarrett, uh, you know, getting their thoughts about it. Dale Earnhardt Jr. was not too keen on this, but it's, I think he's one of these people that looks at it and says, it's an experiment. It's, it's something we need to look at and just see how it's going to work. I mean, for that matter, if they want to get a little bit more daring, why don't they try something that's like uh, one of these road courses or one of these little trips that they have? Uh, we had it back in uh, uh, Wise County and Norton here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it'd be a little bit tough for them, but uh, they had a, a bunch of race teams that uh, went on this uh, excursion to the top of High Knob and came back down again. And, uh, you know, it's straight up. I mean, it's almost, you know, you're looking at, it's just under a mile, a mile up, but still, it's rough to have to get up there, the curves and everything else. Uh, maybe NASCAR needs to look at one of these uh, road challenges or a road course sort of thing, sort of like what Robbie Gordon's done in, in places like over in Africa and different things like that, but in a more controlled environment. I think that would be interesting, but, you know, this is just the first. We'll just see how this goes, but I think it's going to go pretty well. Yeah, you know, I know it's a controlled environment, certainly, but, uh, you know, racing around, in a city on streets that other people, you know, will be driving on after the race is over. Certainly uh, it kind of makes you think a little bit about the roots of NASCAR, which, which right. is guys who were out running the revenueers. I mean, it's, 
know? That's right. They're driving around, and it's all you know. All, the only thing missing is the actual guys with sirens chasing them. But other than that, it makes you kind of feel like this is this is getting back a little bit to the roots of NASCAR. Yeah, that's me. That's the way I feel about it. I mean, the only thing that we're not seeing is these guys being able to tweak the car and be able to do little things to make it go faster. I mean, <laughs> all these cars are pretty much set now in speed. You know, if you've got a car that actually does better, yeah, it's not as simple as just going under the hood and fixing the car in just a few short minutes or putting a new head or putting something else on the engine to make it go faster. Uh, they're going to have to do what they've uh, do the best with what they've got when they hit this course in Chicago this coming weekend. But yeah, you're right. I think this reminds me a lot of outrunning the revenuers and everything. The only thing <laughs> it's missing is just a car full of shine. That's the only thing that's missing out of the car. So a car full of shine and being out on back roads in the middle of the night and, and wondering where the cops are. Um, not that not that uh, any of either of us have ever been in a car like that um, in the middle no. of the night in the middle of nowhere. Uh, seeing wonder Just where no the cops family. Are. <laughs> I know family. I've had family involved in it and everything. And actually, I, I've got to say, it probably was on one side of my family, but I definitely know it was on my wife's side of the family. But I don't know if he <laughs> ran as much. I don't know if they ran as much by car as much as he flew it out on an airplane. <laughs> I know that. I mean, that's 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 a story that we've kind of laughed at. My wife and I have kind of laughed at over the years. At least, you know, her great grandfather was pretty innovative about things. He he got it done by putting it on a plane and flying it to Cincinnati. That's what he ended up doing. So interesting. Yeah, I had cousins and uncles who uh I mean, they built race cars and the way you test a race car that you're building is you just go find a back road where you don't think any cops are and you see how fast right. it goes. So um that's, that's kind of what they're doing in chicago this weekend uh yeah uh, it'd be interesting to catch up with with what they have to do and of course we'll be back here next week uh to break down the action and as always rod thank you for your time and your insight appreciate it, chris don't forget there's going to be a number of uh, formula one drivers going to be involved in this race too and a guy from the 24 hour of le mans at race jensen bouton i think is going to be racing in this race coming up on this weekend. So uh, we might be seeing some more Formula One and IndyCar drivers making their way back into uh, NASCAR before it's over with. I think this thing's getting set for a worldwide debut one way or another. So uh, just be watching. Let's see what happens. We'll have to see how they do. Well, as always, uh, Rod Mullins with his great insight on NASCAR. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great day.